Hello and welcome to Meeting Midway, Tier 2 Prevention, hosted by the Missouri Department of Mental Health. My name is Carl Hunger, and I will be your chaperone as we walk together through Tier 2 supports. What is it? How does it work? What does it use and how do we use it? Together we'll do a deep dive with each episode into this topic to gain greater knowledge about this subject. At the end of each episode, it's hoped that you'll have a greater understanding about Tier 2 supports and see how it relates to your daily lives. And with that, let's move on to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Meeting Midway. On this episode, we're talking with Nicole Jones about enriched environments. Nicole and I first discuss what an enriched environment is, what evidence exists to support this intervention and its benefits. We then discuss how to set up an enriched environment, how to maintain it, and finally factors that teens need to factor in when considering this intervention. Taking very much a proactive approach, enriched environments is potentially a low cost, low effort intervention that pays off big rewards for the individual and staff. For additional information on enriched environments, feel free to review the show notes below. And with that, let's move on to the show. Hey everyone. So today we have Nicole Jones on the show. Nicole, do you want to give the audience a little bit of who you are in your background, please? Yes. My name is Nicole Jones, like Carl was talking about, and I'm the director of risk prevention for the Missouri Department of Mental Health Division of Developmental Disabilities. And as such, I kind of oversee our tier two program at the state, uh, which really focuses on a multi-tiered systems of support. And we focus on specifically at the tier two level, risk prevention and targeted interventions, but it's a continuum of support. I've been in human services for a very long time. I started with foster care and I was a children's service worker for a long time before I moved over to DMH and fell in love with positive behavior supports and the systems approach that it takes to helping a whole population of people. And so here I am today. All right. Excellent. So, so this show is about enriched environments. Nicole, can you give us just an idea of what is an enriched environment, please? Sure. So an enriched environment is essentially an antecedent behavioral intervention. So what does that mean? That means it is a proactive strategy that we can put in place. It doesn't rely on challenging behavior happening for us to do something about it. So what you're going to do when you're implementing an enriched environment is you're going to feel, fill that person's environment with items or activities that mean something to them that they have a preference for with the intention that they would then engage in those activities, they'd be freely available and therefore more likely to engage with the things that matter to them and that are important to them, as opposed to engaging into challenging behavior. And so it's really, you're setting up a way for this person to um, go after and do things, behaviors they enjoy, as opposed to engaging some of those challenging or problematic behavior. All right. So just to kind of summarize this, so I understand, basically, uh, I'll just use the example of my young daughter. She has a small little stuffed bear called, uh, that's a panda that she loves for about the past two years. She sleeps with it. She typically takes it on vacations and things like that. So would that kind of be an example of an enriched environment? Cause it's an item within her environment that she can easily access and play with and carry around that gives her comfort and all that. Yeah, kind of, but you would have more than just the, the, the panda. You'd have a lot of things that are available to her. So let's think about like. That's a good example. Let's think about a child. If you're a parent and you're taking a child to the doctor's office, we know waiting rooms can be hard <laughs> because often we're sitting in them for a long time and we're trying to maintain our children's behavior <laughs> at that time, right? We're trying to keep them from crawling and bouncing off the walls or throwing a tantrum, right? And so if you're wanting to maybe manage those behaviors, you could set up an enriched environment because waiting rooms aren't, right? They got maybe some magazines. They got some chairs. If you're really lucky, maybe the doctor's office does have some toys available, uh, but not always. And so you would bring things with you. You might bring your iPad. You might bring their favorite stuffed animal like your panda. You might bring snacks. You might bring a, a couple of things. So they have multiple behaviors that they could engage in that you want to see happening, like playing on the iPad or playing with the bear or coloring on their book, as opposed to engaging in behaviors that aren't. And you would pick things that are meaningful to them, right? So iPads are pretty, pretty fun for most kids. And so that most of the time they were going to get engaged in that, as opposed to if you try to bring them um, math problems, they're, they're not likely to engage in math problems versus the iPad. You're going to pick something that they prefer and are likely to engage in. 
Okay, so it really sounds like the godsend of the iPad and tablets on long car trips. That's an enriched environment of just having the snacks and yeah, you have iPads lots of activities and all that. available all at okay. the same time, so they can choose what they want to engage in and are less likely to engage in that whining or the temper tantrum, temper tantrum throwing, and things like that. My next question is, what does evidence say about enriched environments? Like, what literature has been out there? Because uh, I think. That's an important thing for the show to have some type of evidence behind it. So can you give us just a little bit of a background of what the studies, evidence, articles, whatever shows about this approach? Yeah, there's a large body of literature around enriched environments. Um, one of the similar articles that I can think of is the Horner article from University of Kansas. He talks about enriched environments. Now that article is from 1980. It definitely shows its age, but did the same thing, had a, a lot of... Um, some participants that have IDD and they're in a very austere environment. And back in that time, back when people were more set up in institutions, it was those kinds of environments. And they looked at self injurious behavior. These individuals engaged in a lot of self injurious behavior. And so then they fill the environment with various items um, and toys and things that might be available for the individuals to engage in. And they saw a decrease in that self injurious behavior and increase in working with the environment and the items and activities that are put in it. Now, this article didn't look at preference assessment, so they didn't look to see, like, did they even like the toys? Did they know how to play with the toys? Did they? None of that was put in place for this study. But since then, there's been a large body of literature around enriched environments or even more contemporary, the competing stimulus. So, like, putting things in place that would compete with problem behavior. So I'm more likely to engage with my iPad as opposed to engage in problem behavior because I like my iPad so much. And so there's a lot of body of literature around it that shows that it can support and reducing challenging behavior and increase desired behavior. And there's also a whole body of uh, literature in the animal uh, literature, animal behavior. So like zoos do this a lot. They enrich environments of animals in cages and captivity so they can try and prevent maladaptive behavior. So it's it's using a lot, a wide variety from children to uh, nursing homes to individuals with IDD all the way to our zoos. Okay, and I think it's really important to maybe note where you've used the iPad and Kindle a lot. There's a pushback because I'm always mindful of like how much screen time my daughter's getting on her Kindle, playing her games, stuff like that. So I assume, like you said, it's multiple items in the environment. Yes. It should just not be one single item, right? It just... Yeah, no, you don't want to just make it one one item. Like, okay. You can't put an iPad in the environment and say, okay, now it's an enriched environment. Like, You want to have multiple choices for this person to engage in things. And so it could be an iPad. It could not be an iPad. It could be like they like to color. It could be that they like to play card games. It could be that they like to build things or tinker or whatever it is, you would put those activities and make it freely available. So if you put it in a locked cabinet, that's not freely available. They can't easily access it. They have to ask somebody else to access that activity. So for an enriched environment to work, it should be freely accessible. They should know how to access it and should be able to, you know, independently maybe do some of those activities. Um, that's not to say that staff or caregivers couldn't be interacting with the individual because yeah, that playing Uno with them, right? That could be an enriched activity. But you should have a variety of both of where you can interact with them, they could do it on their own, um, large variety, and ideally things that they enjoy um, and that matter to them. So what are the benefits of an enriched environment for both the individual and the staff supporting them? So we've kind of talked about kids, but let's kind of focus a little bit more on someone maybe 16 and older who may have staff because they are in a residential home, maybe outside the home, or things like, of that nature. Yeah, so if we're thinking about individuals or maybe being supported by staff or older care, you know, caregiver kind of situation, the benefits can be that it's a proactive approach, right? So um, it does take some planning and some 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 thought behind it, but it's not a situation where challenging behavior is occurring and we're like, okay, now staff do this thing. This is something that's happening all the time um, in the environment. Um, it doesn't take a ton of resources or specialized knowledge to pull it off. Like you don't need a specialized degree to be able to set up an enriched environment. It helps to decrease challenging behavior a lot of times if we're doing it well. And it does take a little bit of planning in the sense that you're going to have to know what matters to this individual and make sure it's available for that individual freely. That individual maybe doesn't know how to access things. You're going to have to teach them how to access those things. You might need to prompt the person 
to access those things. So there might be some teaching components into it, as well as, again, just doing that research of what matters and what should be happening. Okay. And that leads me kind of into my next question, because you kind of alluded to it. Because it sounds like you're really investing in the individual to get to know them so they know what their preferences are, their preferred activities, things of that nature, when you can only do that through basically just getting to know them, maybe having a plan that kind of dictates what their likes and dislikes, so on and so forth. So let's just dive in just a little bit of how does a caregiver, staff, or parent, or whoever set up an enriched environment? Because what you mentioned, it doesn't sound too complicated, and it can be rather simple or can be not rather simple or complicated. I'm sorry. Uh, so it's, it's not too complicated. It's not something that, like I said, takes a lot of resources or specialized knowledge to do, but it does take some planning. So the first thing we need to do is be able to assess this person's preference. Like, what do they like? What matters to them? What is something they, they generally would want to engage in? Um, and so how do we figure that out? There could be lots of ways, right? We could, we could ask the person, right? Person's in a room, like, what matters to you? What do you like doing? Ask that person. Get a list of items and activities that matter to them. If we are, aren't able to ask the person, or maybe the person doesn't quite know, maybe we observe the person. So make a lot of things available, provide a lot of different activities, see what they're engaging in. Um, and then be like, okay, they might like these things, right? You might also talk to family, friends, people that know the person well, take some inventory of like what matters to them, what are activities they like, those kinds of things to be able to kind of identify how to set up the environment in a way for this person to engage in those behaviors. It doesn't have to be difficult. Like think for yourself, for example, like what do you do in your free time? You know, like, do, do you go to your library and you're, you snuggle up with a good book? Do you, you go to your, your computer and play video games? Like, what do we normally do every day to kind of engage in us when we got our downtime or times that we're not actively engaging in other tasks throughout our day? And how do we set up those environments to be comfortable and good for what we want to do? And so a similar kind of process, you're setting up an environment to support that person and what they like to do and what matters to them. Um, so this is a very person-centered type of approach, but it's not static. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay. Yeah. And it sounds like, although communication is a big part of it, so the person may it ideally would be able to say what their likes, dislikes, preferences are, so on and so forth. There are other avenues where someone, let's say maybe is nonverbal or has limited communication to where, again, like you mentioned, the observations, staff and, uh, family and caregivers just kind of observing like, yeah, they really like Jeopardy at four o'clock or three o'clock. I don't, I have no idea when Jeopardy is on anymore, but so that's like a preferred set environment. Like they really enjoy watching that show. So again, I think it's really important that it's apart from check and check out, which does rely heavily on verbal communication with the staff. This one is a little bit more broader in that you can almost do it with a much larger group of individuals, right? Yeah. You, so you wouldn't need someone to be verbal to be able to set up an enriched environment for them. It, it makes it a little harder, right? Can't You can't just necessarily ask them, what do you like? What do you don't like? But you can get that, right? You can observe them. You can provide different things to them to see what they engage in. But you can also ask, you know, family, caregiver, staff of like, hey, what typically does this person spend their time doing? What matters to them? Where do they allocate their time? Um, and then put those things available on the environment for free. All right. So now let's move on to basically how do we maintain an enriched environment? You kind of may have mentioned on the previous question that it's not really static. It's kind of evolving. So people's interests do change. And at different times, one thing brings them joy versus another time. It's like, no, that doesn't bring me joy anymore. So how can staff or caregivers or just supporting in individuals maintain an enriched environment? So you're absolutely correct. People's interests change. What matters to us doesn't always matter to us. A good example of like just everyday society is when pumpkin spice lattes come out, right? Like everybody's just crazy about your pumpkin spice and everybody wants pumpkin spice. But by the time we get to like the winter months, everyone's burned out. No more, <laughs> no more pumpkin spice. I'm over it. Um, and that's very true. Like there's things that we're really into and it may be for a short period of time. It might be forever, but our interests do change. And so if we think just, you know, assessing one time what this person likes 
um, and what matters to them is enough, then we're going to be setting ourselves up for failure. We really should be assessing preference throughout. We see they're not engaging in an activity anymore, but maybe that's not something that they find valuable. And so maybe it's not something that we necessarily need to make sure still is around in the enriched environment. Maybe we need to assess for different preferences and see if there's other things that this person would rather have. We also might introduce novel items and activities. So in this field, a lot of times the individuals that we support maybe have some very narrowed or specified tastes and likes and stuff. And so it might be worth it to also introduce some novel activities and novel items because you don't know it until you try it, right? And so you might introduce playing Uno. They've never played Uno before and you play Uno and it's like the best game ever and we love Uno. And so then we know, hey, this is an additional thing. So you could periodically have staff introduce new items and activities and things to do to keep things varied, to keep things interesting, to learn new stuff. Um, and that helps support that enriched environment over time. All right. And I'm probably going to lose listeners on this, but I just got to put it out there. I despise pumpkin spice. <laughs> <laughs> your, your example just made me cringe there. That is not a preferred item for me. I'm much more into the mint one that kind of comes out in December, but yeah, that's, ooh, yeah, no. So, uh, so sorry for any listeners that really like the pumpkin spice, but that is not for me. So, so if you're setting up an enriched environment for me, don't ever do pumpkin spice or anything like that. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, I'm really happy that you mentioned that because that is part of the tier two model and just the overall MTSS model as well. Basically nothing is ever static. You constantly have to come back and monitor and check with fidelity make sure things are running properly and if there's like little tweaks you have to do the system allows for that i mean am i in the right ball field there yeah no i mean the the whole cycle for any sort of system implementation right is assess see where your gaps are right put plans in place to address those gaps monitor how are things going are we are we doing well are we not doing well if we're not doing well what's going wrong how can we tweak it if we are doing well what's next um, do we fade out supports do we maintain because this is a valuable system, you know, so that that kind of general cycle is an ongoing support for any system that you're going to put in place for positive behavior supports. All right. So my second to last question is really just with certain interventions, we have to consider different factors. So with check and check out, there's of course staff buy-in is the person able to communicate verbally their preferred expectations, what they want to work on, stuff like that. But what needs to be considered with enriched environments, for example, the cost of the items, the maintenance, the communication staff being able to take the time to invest in the individual? I mean, does all that need to be factored in? Yeah, so definitely the planning phase takes probably the most amount of time and effort because you're really working to identify what matters to this person. Um, and then working to arrange to get those things available freely in the environment, right? So that does take some time, whether it's observing the person, whether it's, you know, asking caregivers, whether it's asking the person themselves, and then of course, figuring out how can we access those things. So this person might already have owned those things and have them freely available. Some of them might not be. Uh, and so what, what can we do to put that in the environment? Will there be a cost to it? So that's something to consider. Also, it's a maintenance piece, right? So to maintain an enriched environment, we have to, to make sure we're assessing preference pretty frequently is, you know, are they still have a very rich environment or is it starting to, to get a little stale? And in which case should we be introducing some novel items and activities to this person throughout? We should also be training staff on how to introduce activities and items, how to interact with the person when they're introducing activities and items, they might need to be training on how to prompt the person, right? There's lots of ways you can prompt a person. Um, and so they might need some training on the different ways you can set that up. You also are probably gonna need to set up some uh, data collection system to see, are we having the impact we want? Are we seeing a reduction in the challenging behavior that we were dealing with? Are we seeing an increase of them engaging either independently or in conjunction with staff in some of these activities? And so those things are things that you would have to think about when you're implementing and monitoring an intervention like this, but it is pretty low effort. I mean, once you have it set up, you got those things in place, really it's just maintaining it at that point. All right, so my last question is, of course, that I usually leave with the show is what resources or tools, or if they wanted to learn more about additional information on this topic, where can they go 
and we'll put those in the show notes. I am going to put a little plug in. If you are a provider in Missouri, we are offering our workshop series on this. It will be coming out, I think, at the end of March is kind of our goal. So if you haven't signed up for that already, please do so. We're going to do a, basically a monthly cycle with all this information. But yeah, but Nicole, where can they find a little bit more information about Enriched Environments? So yeah, um, just like you were talking about, Carl, we have our monthly workshops. And so we have a workshop that's around Enriched Environments, and it's more about how to set up a system to support using Enriched Environments. So um, here we're talking a little bit about like what it looks like one-on-one -on -one for the person, but this is like focused on how can you set this up agency-wide? So if you have a person that might need Enriched Environments, how do you know how do you intervention match and know that that's something they need? And then how do you set it up to, from implementation start of planning it all the way through? We will also have a recording, a recorded training that goes with that. So that would be an on-demand learning opportunity for people to access. And so if you have questions, you can always email us at tier2 at dmh.mo.gov, um, which I'm sure you'll put in the show notes. There's also some, some literature, some articles that we can link, the Horner article, like I said, it's very dated. It's from 1980. It's one of the originals. And it, it kind of started off this train of research of how can we compete with challenging behavior and set up the environment to get the behavior we desire and see different types of behavior that are important to us. And so um, it doesn't have everything and anything you'd want in it. But then there's also some additional literature that, you know, it's more contemporary that talks about how do you set this up and set it up. So we'll make sure I can send those over to you, Carl, so you can put those in the show notes. Nicole, it has been a pleasure. You've been on another podcast with me and you're always a wealth of information. So I want to thank you for being on the show. And yeah, we're going to put all the information that Nicole just mentioned in the show notes below. And again, Nicole, thank you. Thank you. Hey everyone, this concludes our show. Thank you for stopping by to learn more about Tier 2 supports and taking a deep dive into this topic with me. If you enjoyed the show, learned something, or perhaps feeling generous, please feel free to hit the like and subscribe feature to receive additional information on shows as they come out in the near future. And with that, please remember to be hopeful, bold, and adventurous in all that you do. Take care, everyone. Bye.